All right. Uh, looks like we're going to get going. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, Ronald and I are up here ultimately to talk about zero trust, but in reality, as the representatives of the CNCF uh, AI working group looking to drum up people to come join us in all of our fancy endeavors. Um, yeah, uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time just kind of framing the, the problem of zero trust. Uh, and then we'll talk about where and how we think ultimately AI can help with these things. I think we've spent a lot of time today talking about threat modeling and how to protect the LLM or how to protect the supply chain of the LLM. But like at the end of the day, how do you want to use this to apply it in the real world is what most people are um, kind of interested in, like the engineers that want to use the LLMs are interested in, right? So first and foremost, I think it's important to know that misconfiguring things, introducing defects, whether they're LLM defects, whether they're implementational defects, whether they're your infrastructure as code defects, cost money. Like you cannot get around this problem of issues cost you money. Uh, the CNCF did a, an actual study on this a couple of years ago and put a number to this. Now, uh, if you notice, the, the ultimate cost of $8,000 is per cluster. Uh, scale that you know, at however many clusters you have in actual production. Uh, let's not talk about your developer, sandbox, whatever other support infrastructure you have. Very, very quickly, uh, the, the cost balloon, right? So you need tools, you need... Um, a plan on how do I reduce these de defects. They're never gonna be eliminated. Like, I don't think we're, we're gonna see a world where bugs are not going to happen, where somebody is not gonna add a period or a, a dot where they shouldn't and cause whatever outage. But how do we work towards reducing this thing? Um, this is where concepts like zero trust start coming into the picture, right? And what is zero trust? Uh, for our, the last couple of years, for sure, I think it's kind of floated around a lot, and everybody that you talk to will tell you that zero trust is this one thing, then you talk to another person, zero trust is a completely different thing to them. And I think that's just generally true. But at the end of the day, it is a set of pillars and concepts that allow you to implement a secure model that should ultimately rolling back to the misconfiguration bit, allow you to reduce those misconfigurations, reduce the, the cost of errors that are inevitably going to happen. Uh, why do we need it or why did it emerge, right? Obviously, cloud native con, uh, everybody understands that infrastructure has exploded, infrastructure has changed dramatically over the last 10, 12 years. Um, you no longer have a kind of a, the distinction between, oh, this is my application server, this is my database server, uh, especially with you know, kind of the explosion of Cube, you can now run a database on your Android phone if you really wanted to. Uh, where, what, how things live no longer really, really matters. That obviously uh, introduces the problem of like, well, well, when I no longer have the walled off garden that I have before, how do I exist in this new world? Uh, as we have seen all day today, attack sophistication is only ramping up as technology sophistication is ramping up. Uh, they're kind of walking in lock and step. So as we are getting prompt injections or we're getting LLM uh, injections happening, um, the, the use of those LLMs is increasing. Attack sophistication obviously is changing. And then, uh, as I said, like when your workload can run one minute in US East and then US East explodes again and then all of a sudden it's now on Europe one, uh, are you sure that what you had set up on US East is running the same way that it is now in Europe one? Uh, I, 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 am, I am sandbagging AWS a little bit there, but they are the only ones that have had major error. Uh, outages the last couple of years, so sorry anybody that's from AWS. All right, so what is 
uh, kind of the core principles of zero trust. Uh, trust is verification. Uh, you'll see it in a little bit, what kind of how that is expressed. Uh, micro segmentation, which is different than microservices. I want to kind of point that out. Just because you have a microservice does not mean that you have segmented things. Uh, least privilege and continuous monitoring. A lot of these things uh, are coming out of standards that NIST is publishing. Uh, a lot of these things, if you kind of want to go super deep on, are things that are coming out of uh, military speak and kind of military protocols, but they are very, very applicable to what we do today. All right, so first and foremost, what is trustless ver verification? The easiest, fastest, quickest thing that we can talk about is MTLS. Uh, if anybody is running service mesh, if anybody has been sold on an Istio or some sort of a uh, service mesh product, that is your immediate and fastest win, right? I now have MTLS between my services. Great, what does that mean? That means that uh, not only am I able to authenticate each service bidirectionally without me having to sit in the middle to guarantee that uh, authenticity, uh, I am now also having to, or, or I also have a centralized way to rotate keys and deal with um, kind of the, the management of my newly introduced TLS infrastructure. But most importantly, you're no longer relying on kind of the outdated model of like, oh, IP whatever is most probably my service, you know, some, some service. I can now for sure say, hey, whoever's holding this certificate, I can create policies based on that certificate and wherever that service may be, whether it's in Europe, whether it's in Asia, whether it's on my phone, I know that that service is the service that it says it is. Uh, it ultimately scales much, much better than kind of the more standard IP-based uh, whitelisting, blacklisting, et cetera. And it starts building, building into micro-segmentation. Once I have that uh, certificate-based identities, I can move away from, as I said, the whitelist, blacklist, the allow, deny, right? I can provide context about what is my service, uh, who is it, what is it supposed to address? Is it supposed to have a unidirectional or bidirectional um, communication with other services within my system? Uh, at the end of the day, right, how all of this is tying into Zero Trust, uh, the most popular project that you can kind of march on the, uh, kind of to this beat is Istio. Uh, you can do it with anything that implements uh, a service mesh, but Istio is probably the biggest, uh, biggest well-known name, uh, brand, let's say. Um, it also kind of builds in kind of nice features that allow you to do load balancing based on those certificates, it allows you to do, uh, you know, A-B testing, which becomes, I think, more and more important uh, as we're talking about introducing LLMs into our daily workflows. Uh, if anybody's been to any AI conferences, you will very much see Istio is a major component of any deployable uh, LLM to production, uh, tying it all together to serve it to the end user, yeah, you will find it there uh, no matter what. All right, uh, I'm gonna skip this because I, I don't know. Uh, furthermore though, beyond the, just the simple authority uh, authorization rules that you can build on, on the certification, certificates that are in place, um, we need a better way to um, build governance of your system. Uh, how do I ensure that whenever my developers create a new, uh, new namespace, for, as an example, how can I start from a deny all policy on my ingress, egress? How can I make sure that any new 
uh, application is properly labeled, has limits and quotas, how, how do I ensure you know, ultimately the governance of my resources, but also the governance of my services. And this is where Kiverno comes in. Kiverno is a governance engine, a policy engine. Uh, you may have heard of one of its major competitors, uh, OPA and Gatekeeper. Uh, it goes away with Rego and goes away with yet another language for yet another purpose and sticks to making us uh, all YAML jockeys that we are. All right, you write all of your uh, policies in YAML, you manage your YAML, you live in YAML all day, great. Uh, but more importantly, because it is staying YAML, it means that you can actually introduce your business people, like teams that are not um, sitting at the console all day or that are not in interfacing with your infrastructure all day, a way to understand, but more importantly to express the rules that they want to enforce on a system. Uh, I think we've all been in, uh, in, in meetings where you sit with, uh, uh, I don't know, some, somebody from the, the business side of the house that says, I want to do X, Y, and Z with the infrastructure, and then the engineer starts going, okay, well, you need, and then list of 20 tools, and then the business person gets up and leaves because they don't have the time to do that. With this, uh, they can now contribute to the overall health and the overall management of said system um, and ultimately avoid any or augment the security uh, that would you know, govern what you're running your LLMs on, what you're running your training on, uh, just govern everything that is in, uh, in scope. All right. Uh, I kind of jumped the gun a little bit, but like again, least privilege, one of the final pillars of zero trust, right? Uh, that's where we are going to use, uh, use Kiverno to further uh, use its kind of mutation and generation abilities to enable you to do these things. Uh, what I mean by mutation and generation, by default, you know, we all want to validate that, hey, the state of the world is the state of the world that I think it is. But what if you want to change it? How do I change it? using the same rule sets or the same policies, um, I can now go, hey, object A, I want you to look like object B, or I want to augment you to A.1. Uh, you're able to do that. Or if you need to generate new things, how many times do we have, uh, you know, I'm going to go back to AWS. AWS can be, a, an, an AWS account can be a wild, wild west, right? Everybody just kind of goes, uh, EKS cuddle, create cluster, and then there is 10 million clusters living there. What if you could actually force the users to tag their clusters, uh, give them a time limit, create exceptions, uh, feed into the remediation, which will, is something that we'll talk about as kind of where does the AI come into all of this? Um, and all this you're achieving through, as I said, through Kiverno. Um, and at this point, we start going into how do we marry all of these things together uh, with AI, with the uh, LLMs, in order to start providing uh, a solution ultimately to the blank page problem. Like I talk about this a lot, uh, and Ron and I were just... Uh, we released the AI landscape to the CNCF, overall CNCF landscape, and then we realized, oh, um, where does something like Kate's GPT fit in? Uh, and my argument uh, at the moment is, we're, we're still having that discussion on GitHub, is that ultimately something like that fits into the remediation space. Um, to me, and I'm glad to have this uh, discussion with anybody post this talk, uh, the state of current LLM technology is fantastic for solving that problem uh, straight out of the gate. Being able to go, hey, I have problem A, I've opened my VS Code, I've opened my VI, and I'm staring at a blinking cursor. I, I think we've all experienced this, some version of this, right? Uh, so being able to arrive at a remediation, being able to arrive at please start here, 
it becomes very, very important. Uh, we did have a bit of a demo, but now we had to switch, uh, <laughs> switch laptops. So I don't know if we're gonna be able to uh, get to that part. So I think I'm gonna hand it off to Ron at this point to continue the, the conversation. All right, thanks, Boris. Okay, so um, part of the, the, the talk here was we want to, we actually do have a demo, um, which we could show after, after the talk. And the idea is, what are some popular tools? What are some best practices that we could actually put together? And then ultimately, take some kind of action. So the action could be humans, or ideally, some kind of agentic style uh, outcome where we could automate this. And so what, what might that look like? So there's all these kinds of um, AI tooling out there, frameworks that you can use but very few of them, if, if any of them, actually integrate with well-known projects, right? It's usually making custom um, code and doing some kind of custom action, which is good, uh, but there's a reason why certain tools exist and why they're popular and, and the power uh, that they bring. So in our case, we decided to uh, take a little sprint, come up with, the, with a, a demo, and uh, the original idea was, is, Istio is known for kind of really capturing a few of the pillars of zero trust, right? If we did nothing with AI, that's kind of what it's known for. So we're like, all right, that's a good tool to, to consider, you know, if we're gonna try to tie these things together. What is Istio missing? Part of it is, is this policy uh, management and, and just the auditing reporting aspects. Nobody ever said Istio was good at generating re reports, right? And so Caverno is, is just that tool. And then in the AI space, we have CageGPT. So just a quick uh, questionnaire. Who here has not used CageGPT at this point? All right, so about half. So um, CageGPT, for those who have not seen it, uh, I think it's a perfect example of what we could practically do today. Most people are jumping way off the deep end trying to make very complicated systems with AI. CageGPT is a perfect example of a very simple thing you can do. And so that's what we'll explain. Uh, and what we've done is taken CageGPT and integrated it with Kiverno, and we're still looking at what it means to integrate it with, with Istio, and we'll, we'll see that now. So for those who have never seen it, real quick, what is it? CageGPT is, uh, we're gonna go with the simple description, single binary that you can point to your Kubernetes cluster, and it does two things. On the left, you can kind of uh, see this where it says, um, about halfway down this, the middle of the screen, it says, CageGPT analyze. What it does is it, it has, in its code, it's hard-coded uh, best practices. And I'm not kidding about that. It is literally, if you see this, say this, right? So there's hundreds <laughs> of these uh, kind of SRE practices hard-coded, and so that's what the analysis phase does. Then the next step is actually where the AI comes in. So it's a two-phase system. Step one, no AI. Step two, AI. And step two is take the output of what it found and feed it into an LLM and get some kind of uh, contextual description on what, what, what's going on and what you might do about it, right? So as somebody who does Kubernetes stuff all the time, this may not seem that impressive. But where I think it's impressive is for people who don't do Kubernetes stuff all the time, right? This can give you a very quick way to describe what you see, what's going on. Now, what CageGPT is lacking is the reasoning abilities beyond that, right? So if you end up capturing 20 things that are wrong, maybe the reality is there's only one thing wrong, right? And these are all the transitive knock-on effects that you're starting to see in your, your events log, your error logs. And so can we actually analyze all these things more holistically? And again, that's where the reasoning aspects come in. So even tools like HGPT, you know, right now we have this hard-coded approach which feeds into this kind of natural language expansion. And then the, the next part is things like agentic actions, reasoning, those kinds of things. So what we've done um, is actually integrated uh, Kiverno into HGPTs uh, as one of its integrations to see if we can capture some more of this semantic analysis of our cluster and then make actual cube cuddle commands come out of it. So we don't see that here, unfortunately, that's on that laptop I could show you uh, here at, at the break. 
uh, but it does work. Okay, so again, the idea is, is what is it that we're actually uh, bringing together? So most clusters use mostly the same tools. And so I wouldn't say KGPT is one of those tools, but definitely Istio and then Caverno uh, and even uh, OPA gatekeeper type, type tooling as, as well. And can we take these known tools with their known best practices and actually, you know, we normally think of AI, we think of things like training, refining, right, all these rag techniques. How do we take that uh, output of those systems to feed into some kind of AI model and come out with actual reasonable actions and then ultimately uh, automate those things? That's really what this is trying to get us to, to think about. And the question is, is does it actually work, right? So for us, we, you know, we tried, uh, again, we don't have it all here to put you to sleep, but we created policies that touch on each pillar of, of, uh, of zero trust. And again, the idea was is can we uh, have those policies, the outcome of these things, take it and then come up with actions to fix our system so we are now zero trust-like? And the answer is yes. Uh, so for baby steps, we were able to do it, but there's plenty more to think about. So again, what is the best ways to take like metric style data, right? The actual ongoing real time um, knowledge of your system versus maybe a policy, you know, report that came, you know, an hour ago. Uh, how do you keep this kind of process going? So there's more work to do. Uh, it's something we're going to keep looking into. We'll share the code with, with everyone uh, who's interested. But again, we think um, this is pretty, pretty good, just a nice basic amalgamation of these tools uh, and techniques. Yeah, so you know, why is, uh, again, uh, I think Ron kind of touched on it uh, in the previous slide. Here we're talking about Istio and uh, Kiverno. It, it could very easily be insert your favorite tools here. What, what we're trying to ultimately arrive at is um, what are the red metrics in the sense of what are the really important inputs that you want into your system to allow you to verify or allow you to troubleshoot or allow you to you know, uh, achieve whatever it is that you're trying to achieve as it relates to a standard that you're trying to apply. Here we're picking zero trust, but you can you know, take whatever Performance. What, what, yeah, performance. Yeah. You want to get better, uh, better med metrics understanding. You want to get better tracing understanding. You insert your problem at the end. Uh, but what would it look like to take the tooling that we have now and um, give you an input that generates a decent enough output to get you started? I don't think any of the you know, we had some practice with, say, Llama 3 versus uh, Cloud versus uh, other models out there, and they produce various, uh, various states of various validity, and obviously there is room for prompt engineering and insert other buzzwords here. You know, garbage in, garbage out, good data in, good data out. Uh, that is a separate problem, ultimately, but I think the key takeaway is we want people to start thinking about, you know, what are good inputs in order to arrive at, you know, solid outputs. I think uh, our previous talk touched on it, and the, the, talk, the lightning talk before that also touched on this. Is um, in order to get to good, valid outputs, you need to have an understanding of what your inputs are and how to get um, important inputs into the system. <clears throat> so, again, I said it earlier, it can be done, right? We, we're trying not to use pie in the sky, new frameworks. We want to use actual real tools that everyone's using. Uh, and again, the, the point here, what we're trying to just convey to you is that it can be done. So, KGPT, it's a Go, Go uh, based software. It's not terribly um, complicated, if, especially if you know Go, uh, to actually modify it and add these systems uh, to it, which was part of our challenge here is like, could we actually do it ourselves? Uh, and again, the complexities are going to come from which tools do you want to integrate? 
is it their inputs? Is it their outputs? Is it, is it both of those things that you need? What about industry best practices? Like right now, for like zero trust, what do you do? You, f you feed in uh, an entire like 500 page guide on what zero trust is into your, into your uh, rag based system and hope that uh, intelligently feeds into this, these results, right? So there's again, plenty of ways to, to slice in and dice this. So uh, I think what we wanna uh, wrap up on is this. First off, for those who have never seen uh, CageGPT, uh, if you want to stick around for a few minutes after, can show you uh, show you our, the, how this works with the uh, Kiverna um, and where it may go, just so you have some kind of appreciation from it. Again, Boris started with we're members of um, you know we don't work for the CNCF, but we are members of of the CNCF and the Linux Foundation, uh, specifically in the AI Working Group. So before you're allowed to go to lunch, we need you to sign up and join our <laughs> Join our cause. We are the gatekeepers of lunch, and um, you know we produce um, white papers on related topics. But just to the point, what is it that we're trying to do versus some of the other AI efforts, especially just in the Linux Foundation? We're trying to be the traffic cops of the cloud native tool chain. So if you have a question on what tools to use to do AI, where might you go? Uh, to get guidance on areas, that's ideal uh, outcome of our, our group. So there's plenty of uh, particular efforts going on, reference implementations, uh, trust and safety type efforts. We're not trying to recreate that, but we are trying to make it uh, understandable and discoverable and useful. So if, if you want to participate uh, in any of those things, we're always looking for help creating you know, blogs, white papers, speaking at conferences, um, all those things. So please join us and uh, we would appreciate the help. Okay. And that yeah. is it. Uh, yeah. Any questions? Yes. So I'm uh, extremely fatigued with network policies. How, uh, how fast can we get that at a pace we can do? I'll go in the house. <laughs> During lunch. <laughs> we, could, we could get it done at lunch. <laughs> I will. <laughs> um, so, so you know, I've, I'm aware of uh, Case GPT. Um, I, I don't have it in production. Uh, how fast do you think I could leverage Case GPT if I have a good work ethic? Uh, I'll just tell you my experience. So, I came out of the blue and, and just tried it, like you know, figure out how to integrate it. Of course, the docs have no description of this. It, it took me four hours. Four hours. But, but I will say, I know Go. So if, okay. as long as you know Go, it's, it's actually quite straightforward to. to Is it all self-contained or does it require internet? Um, self-contained. You, you, I mean, ultimately you do need an, somewhere to run the LLM that is going to go ask for, for to do work. Yeah, that right? second, the so second need, phase. Right, right, yeah. So you can run uh, a llama. So that, that's actually another uh, fix we did is add direct llama support so it could run that easily. So that, again, was pretty easy to do. And, and you were talking about could you add Kyverno? So you have, uh, is it part of the docs? You have Kyverno running and that was the test that you were doing? Yeah, yeah. so, okay. so we have uh, on my laptop <laughs> the whole thing set up. Uh, Kyverno's just running as untouched, like there's nothing special about it. The only codified thing we changed was is adding like um, the swagger support so it understands like the CRDs coming out of Kubernetes that are related to the reports from Kiverno and then take that and do the machinery of KHGPT. It's, you know, parsing it for, you know, again, step one, hard coded things you're interested in and then step two, feed that into a, to an LLM. So step one, that step one was is, all right, of all these reports of Kiverno, which one are bad, right? Because sometimes it's good, right? You don't want to do anything with the good stuff, right? You're just looking for the bad stuff. So what does it mean to look for bad? And so there was a little bit of work there and that more work, just me being newer to Kiverno, I was like, all right, what do I look for, right? But once I worked together with the expert, uh, it was easy. And how, how long about do you think that took um, to go from discovery to what you have now? Uh, that about four or five hours. Okay. Okay. Can I do it in four or five hours? <laughs> it, it, it was, it was, it was, it wasn't that bad. They actually, you know, to their credit of KGPT, even though it's not the best documented thing in the world, 
it's straightforward enough that I think my major insight was is just using it, realizing it's a two-step thing. Once you know that, you actually see that in the code, right? And you see how they did it, but that's something they could probably do better on the docs is like, they say it, but you don't feel it until you are looking a little deeper. I got a question right up here. Yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, hold on one second, get the mic. You're getting a, you're getting a, yeah. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, uh, I am using Cilium mm -hmm. uh, as a CNI. Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible to integrate your s solution uh, with Cilium instead of Istio? Because uh, I yeah. use Cilium cluster mesh option. Yep. Yeah, there, there isn't a, a again, we grab these tools because I used to work for the founders of Istio and now I, I'm working with Kiverno. The tools that you use should be irrelevant. Um, giving yeah. it the framework to take the data from the tools you want to get you to, okay, I ru I'm running Cilium, I wanna add Kiverno, and boom, I'm getting to, I'm not gonna say the magic bullet of I have zero trust, but like you are starting to move towards that uh, position much, much faster than you were if you were trying to do it. You know, on do your you own. have a plan to integrate Cilium? I'm sorry? No, we have, we have it. This was just our pet project to yeah. demo this. We're actually going to work with the KHTPT project to see if right. they'll, they'll integrate it. So j just to throw it out there, KHTPT is interested in trying to see what the community wants with this. So how do you integrate with, with tools? So just to give you an idea how, how it was done, um, the, the, the binary does an API call to the, to, to the Kate's server looking for CRDs, basically, right? So whatever you put in that CRD, as long as you could download it and parse it, you could do whatever you want. So if it's Cilium, Istio, you know, Opa, it doesn't matter. You just have to integrate that API uh, deserialization, and then you just say, if I see an error, put that in the payload we're sending to the LLM or not, right? And that's, it's actually quite straightforward. Thank you, thank you very much. I have one more question then. <laughs> Just for a network policy friend over here, I, I think um, what it's gonna do, like Kavona's gonna let you say there should be a network policy, but it's not gonna like analyze your network traffic, figure out what, like who should be talking to who, and like it's not actually gonna write the network policy for you, right? Uh, no, not Kiverno. Well, it can. Yeah. Kiverno can generate it, but like, should it? You know? <laughs> I, I think that's, it, I think it, that's it, what it, our friend was looking for here, right? Like, I can kind of clarify uh, something to monitor, something to monitor the traffic. Mm -hmm. And then if you have a network policy, then you can Yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the, what we're, I know, very poorly down here at the bottom alluding to is like, in the case of like network policy, we, we want metrics of what's happening now, and then based on what is a, you know, narrative form, best practice, can we magically generate the thing that will fix that? So yeah, we, again, we're in the nascent baby, you know, uh, Space Odyssey 2001 stage here, right, of, of doing this, but that's exactly right. Can we get, come out with a better solution at the end of all that, and then ideally automate it? But again, the, your, your, the answer to your question, yes, it's possible. Istio generates, I'm using Istio, because again, that's what we were using. Istio generates network traffic. Envoy emits a ridiculous amount of metrics that you can track to figure out all of those things. Package that up into the LLM, the LLM can then go and generate your Kiverno policy if you want, or your network policy directly. The usage of Kiverno is probably, I know, I appreciate abstracting it because I have to create solutions very similar to what you're talking about with 
again, in my actual job uh, with, with customers that use Kiverno to use its generative uh, kind of abilities to create the, hey man, this is not the Wild Wild West. I need, I need, I need, to, I need a traffic cop here. And we had one more. I think we we're definitely over, but we had one more. Early, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I, you know, thinking, um, thinking. obviously we, we did not spend thousands and thousands of uh, GPU dollars uh, to test some of this, but I can tell you that like obviously models are improving um, and I think that is very much a possibility. I think you're, and I, I know I'm kind of driving into it, but like your input output matrix is still going to be the most important. If you have, if you figure out what your red, red inputs are from the data that you have about your system, your problem, it makes it extremely likely the, the output is going to be the closest thing to uh, reality. So like I can tell you that like the first time we ran this with Llama 3, it generated goobly gook. It, you know, it, it created something, some mix between Kiverno and Rego policy, which obviously doesn't exist. Uh, the moment I gave it a little bit more context uh, and fed it a bit more data from the cluster, from the policy itself, uh, it started generating something that was much, more, much closer to the truth. So, you know, uh, again, back to the original thing, just that, that input, output, garbage in, garbage out, it, you just, you have to figure out, I think that's kind of been the theme all day that I figured out, is you have to get to the, the truth of like, what's good input. <clears throat> all right, I, I think now everybody's hungry and they wanna go, but. Honestly, when you look at it, I would say it's a, a bastardized rag because we're using Kiverno to generate you know, context and we're using Istio to generate context. Obviously, the best thing would be to find a model that, or to build a model that is designed for this so I'm not having to you know, uh, kind of square peg, round hole, open models, but yeah. And we did try to keep it simple d deliberately just because there's so many tools and techniques. We wanted to, I know we didn't show the code, but we wanted to actually show it is simple to do if you, yes. if you kind of just keep the focus, right? Okay, uh, thank you. And yeah, thank you.